So last week we started a little book, Social and Communal Harmony by Bhikkhu Bodhi, which I hope I can see many of you already have in your hands. That's great. Uh, wonderful. <laughs> So we actually only got through the very first little excerpt of a sutta called Right View Comes First. And there's a lot more I could say about that, but I do want to get onto the next couple. Having said that, would it be helpful to just read through it once more or not necessary? Yeah, yeah, just read through it. Okay, but without much discussion. So, I'm going to use the word community today instead of monks. Community, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong view as wrong view and right view as right view. This is one's right view. And what is wrong view? There is nothing given, nothing sacrificed, nothing offered. There's no fruit or result of good and bad actions. There's no this world, no the other world. There's no mother, no father, no being spontaneously reborn. And there are in the world no ascetics and Brahmins of right conduct and practice who, having realized this world and the other world for themselves, by direct knowledge, make it known, make them known to others. This is wrong view. And in one of the other suttas, Majjhimuni um, Kaya number 60, that is referred to as the nihilist kind of view. So you're sort of negating all, yeah, act, all causes all effects of causes, let's say. So it's like saying that there is no result of um, good or bad action. Yeah. So then he says, what is right view? Right view, I say, is twofold. There's right view that's affected by the influxes, that's our sellers, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. And there's right view that's noble, free from influxes, super and mundane, and a factor of the path. So in other words, one right view is a kind of preliminary right view that we have before we're stream winners, before we attain the first stage of enlightenment. And the other one is the right view that's really unshakable that we have after stream entry. And what is right view subject to the influxes? That's what most of us have, I would think, <laughs> unless you're all stream winners, partaking of merit and riping in the acquisitions. There is what is given, sacrificed and offered. There is fruit and result of good and bad actions. There is this world and the other world. There is mother and father. There are beings spontaneously reborn. There are in the world aesthetics and Brahmins of right conduct and right practice who, having realized this world and the other world for themselves by direct knowledge, make them known to others. This is the right view subject to influxes, partaking of merit and ripening in the acquisitions. So here is already suggesting that karma and rebirth is part of that preliminary right view. Even if you don't yet fully believe it, you're taking it on board. Um, you haven't verified it yet perhaps, but you recognize that there are good and bad actions, that, the, that there are fields for those good and bad actions. So by, for example, giving to a mother or father, um, offering to a good ascetic, a monastic or a Brahmin, somebody of right conduct, is going to increase those wholesome effects. That is going to result in good, um, good results for you and for others. And what is right view that is noble, free from influxes, super mundane, and a factor of the path? So this is for the stream entry. The wisdom, the faculty of wisdom, the power of wisdom the investigation of states enlightenment factor, the path factor of right view. In one whose mind is noble, whose mind is without influxes, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. This is right view that is noble, free from influxes, super mundane and a factor of the path. So this is when it's actually samaditi. So sama means right, but it means right in the sense that it should lead towards um, becoming noble, hmm? becoming a stream entrer. So it's right in the sense that it's directed towards the goal. One makes an effort to abandon wrong view and to enter upon right view. This is one's right effort. Mindfully one abandons wrong view 
and mindfully one enters upon and abides in right view. This is one's right mindfulness. So mindfulness is not only of what you're doing, the present moment, etc. It's also understanding right from wrong. Thus, these three states run and circle around right view, that is right view, right effort and right mindfulness. So I did just make a few notes to give a bit more context to the first right view, which is um, the, the preliminary right view, yeah? The one that's still partaking of merit and influxes and the one that most of us are developing at this stage on our path. And uh, this is from the Apanaka Sutta, Majjhima number 60. And I already mentioned the first wrong view that there's nothing given, that there is no mother and father. And that's a kind of nihilism. So the Buddha says that this is, um, it's not like, oh, you're wrong and so you're stupid and it's just saying somebody's wrong for the sake of, you know, saying that they're wrong. It's actually because there's a consequence and an outcome of having such a view. And the Buddha says that with such a view, it can be expected that people will avoid good bodily, verbal and mental conduct. Because if there's no result of your action, why does it matter? You can do what you want and it won't have any different effect. We can be greedy, we can, you know, just engage in as much sexuality as we want to. It doesn't matter as long as we're pleasing our senses, you know, there's going to be no, um, there's nothing wrong or right about any of it. So you can see this is quite a common um, way of thinking in the West. I also think of it as sometimes one of the, um, some, one of the shadow sides, perhaps of atheism, but not necessarily because uh, you, know, you don't have to be a religious person or a spiritual person to, to just perform good deeds for the sake of it and to re recognize that that's when you're more aligned to your humanity. Um, but it also says that they, um, they don't see, the danger is that they don't see the danger and degradation of the unwholesome or the blessing of renunciation. And they can convince others to accept an untrue Dhamma because of course we always like to impress our views on others. So if we have wrong view and we're trying to convince everybody of our wrong view, that there's no karma, there's no rebirth, etc., then that actually makes extra bad karma. All right. So be careful of those people who not only don't believe rebirth, which you don't have to, um, but try to convince others against it because there's really no need. I mean, the whole of the Buddha's path is to explore these things for ourselves. And it says also that somebody has the danger of abandoning virtue and praising oneself and disparaging others. This is also the problem with the wrong view. You start to praise yourself and think everybody else is, um, is wrong. And then the second uh, wrong view in that sort of is the uh, wrong view of non-doing. Okay, so this is more like what I said about the first one, but it's an extension of that, that there's no merit or outcome of any action at all. So you, it's quite gory in the sutta. It actually says, even if you slaughter bodies and pile them up on, you know, on the highway, maybe something similar to what's happening in Burma right now. You know, people are just being fired at indiscriminately on orders to shoot in the head, you know, and sometimes they can't bring the bodies back from the street in order to give them a funeral. So in this particular case, they believe that there will be no, that it's not evil to do that and that there'll be no outcome of those evil deeds. In other words, it's a very ignorant view, a very, very dangerous view. And then there's the wrong view of non-causality. That basically things are beyond our capacity to have any influence over and things are molded by destiny and circumstance. I mean, that is actually also what sometimes people mistake as karma. They think karma is some kind of fatalism. You know, oh, you're suffering now because of your past karma, past bad karma or bad deeds in the past. And this is also... Um, a wrong understanding because karma, the doctrine of causality should never be used to justify oppression or poverty or, you know, any other maybe disability that somebody has. It's really not compassionate and wise to say, oh, that must be because you've done something bad in the past. That's actually using karma in the reverse order. 
um, because it's always about if you do say something unwholesome in the present, it will lead to certain effects in the future. And one of those may be that you're born into poverty, for example. But it doesn't mean that if somebody's born into poverty, that they must have done that bad thing because there are many causes for being born into poverty. So it only works in forward order and not in reverse. That's an important uh, aspect of karma to understand. And then the other wrong views are that there are no material, no immaterial realms. So this is interesting because this is getting quite um, into sort of uh, a very sort of spiritual understanding, you know, actually realizing that there are these very refined realms of existence that we can access, not only after death, but also through our meditation, right? So the immaterial realms or the uh, arupas as talked about in the suttas where there is a fading and a cessation of materiality. So there are beings who are born in those realms without any sort of materiality. It's just a pure mental realm. And we can even experience that in this life in certain levels of meditation if we have very powerful minds. So that's also one of the wrong views. And again, most of us won't know those realms through our experience, but at least we can have an open mind that such things may be possible. And there are beings who have experienced these things. And that brings so much confidence, inspiration and faith. You know, when you meet people, you can ask them about these experiences and they've actually, you know, been able to touch those. I mean, as I say, touch it. Really, they've been able to disappear enough for those uh, experiences to be experienced, let's say, because there's hardly any sense of self in there. And then the last wrong view is that there's no cessation of being. And this is very important because often, even in the Buddhist realm, some teachers will teach that the mind is permanent. And I don't know how they're bringing this about because it's so clear throughout the suttas that, you know, the five khandhas include vijnana, which is consciousness. And that includes mind consciousness, right? And you can't have a mind without awareness you can't have a mind without consciousness <laughs> so the buddha never said that there's this chitta that's kind of transcendent if he did then it should have been on every page in the pali canon loud and clear but it isn't and so here the idea that there's no cessation of being is also one of the wrong views and it says that um that believing that there's no cessation of being, that we continue to exist even after parinibbana in some kind of transcendent way, um, that kind of view is close to lust, close to bondage, close to delight and close to clinging because we still want to be somehow. And then the doctrine that there is cessation of being is also not quite right view, but it's closer. The reason it's not perfect right view is because we misapprehend this thing, this five kanda phenomena as a being. So to say there is a cessation of being <laughs> is coming from a sense of self because we think there's this being, but it's different when we think about cause and effect, like we could think about this so-called being is just a conditioned process and that there can be a cessation when those causes end, then there's a cessation of the effects. So in that sutta, the Buddha says that thinking that way is closer because then there's a chance. Yeah, it, it's close to non-loss, non-bondage, disenchantment, fading and cessation. So in other words, that view is closer to Nibbana. But the problem with it is still that we think of it in terms of a being ceasing. <laughs> yeah, that's the main problem with that view. So I wanted to bring those other five in to pad out the first sutta, because it also gives more context to the preliminary right view. You can see the extremes of views that would be possible to have without the right view, right? Extremes like that there's no outcome of our actions whatsoever. And the danger there in just taking free license to do whatever you want for your own gain and not have to worry about the consequences of that, not even notice the consequences of that. So, I've only used 15 minutes to go over last week's, so I'm 
quite confident that we can get into some new territory now. And for anyone who thinks I'm going over things a lot, <laughs> I don't know why I'm saying this, it's just a funny, a funny note, it's no, not a justification. But Vansajato, apparently, I wasn't there, when he was the abbot of Santi Forest Monastery in New South Wales, sometimes he'd give a sutta class, he'd do one sutta in about 20 parts, and the first one or two classes would be on one word, one word. <laughs> So, so we're getting through quite a lot. Good. So before we go on, I'd like to just pause and check whether there's any, uh, any comment, any doubt, any scrambled brain over it, or I don't know, anything you can see is uh, pertinent, relevant, anything you'd like to say. Uh, so you use your little raise hand button, if so, because I would like to make sure you're still with me at this stage before we go on. Nothing yet? Okay. Ah, Diana. You should get a sign, yep. Just got it. Hi. Hi. I feel like Strong view or attachment to view is so prevalent right now in the world, especially mm. now that this forum to express view, i.e. the internet and social media, is available to everyone. And so thank you for going over this again. It's very helpful to remember what right view is, and it isn't having an opinion about what you think is the truth, what mm. science says, which politic political you know opinion you think is and so forth it's yeah. it can be really distressing mm. yeah that's a really good point because i think it is clear from even preliminary right view that it's not about fixing to those views it's more about starting to recognize in our lives that there is the result of good and bad actions. So you know for yourself what kind of views, even political views, would lead to your own and others' benefit and what kind of views wouldn't. And we don't judge people for holding this view or that view, but rather we see for ourselves what is a skillful view to adopt in order to reduce suffering, in order to facilitate the arising of compassion. You know, for example, you see somebody suffering and you can just think, well, they suffer for their karma, you know, the Buddha taught about karma. But does that really open the heart? Does that cause a, a sort of sense of wanting to protect life, wanting to help, wanting to, you know, um, address some of the injustices and, and, and oppression in the world? So, yeah, that's a really good point. And it is an exploration. The, the preliminary right view is mostly about cause and effect. But then the other right view, you know, when we become truly a noble person, and even beforehand, we start to have an appreciation of the Four Noble Truths. So again, it's looking at suffering, you know, and the cause of suffering and the way out of suffering. So it's not, are these people right or wrong? It's more like, is this behavior, is this way of thinking, acting and speaking, is this leading to freedom from suffering or to more suffering? Um, and that's the important thing. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's so pragmatic. And, and in the next sutta, actually, I want to get into that um, sequence because the next sutta is an excerpt from the Samaditi Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya number nine. And throughout Majjhima Nikaya number nine, every single um, phenomena that the Buddha analyzes is analyzed in terms of it's there, it has a cause, it has a cessation, and there's a path to the cessation. So every single aspect that he's looking at is seen with that formula. And some people liken that formula to like a doctor's prescription, right? You go to the doctor, there's a disease, they diagnose the disease, then they have to look for the cause, then they have to look for, yeah, they have to believe that there's a way to, you know, there's a cessation of it. You're wanting the cessation of it. And then they have to give you the prescription, the way to the cessation of that disease. So in this sense, the Buddha is giving um, a path 
So right view in a sense is, is less of a view and more of an orientation that you use to walk on a path. And in that way, right view comes first as we discussed last week, you know, it's like um, a map. It's like having a map. So you know where you are right now, but you also know the terrain that you have to cover and you know that there's a certain way to get from A to B. And if you go off this way, you'll be going off at a tangent. So it's very, very important. This is what the Buddha's teachings are for. In a sense, everything you read in the suttas is to get you established in right view so that you have the full context of the teachings and you won't go off course. Because we might start, say, here and think that we're going like this, or we might be a tiny, tiny bit off course and we think it doesn't matter. But it's like, if you're even a tiny bit off course, you might be walking along the same path for a while, but then suddenly it might, it's like, it just starts to go like this. And what looks as though you were not so far off in the beginning, when you're walking a completely different way, it ends up miles and miles apart. <laughs> or you can walk on the path in a straight line and you go in the right way, but you get to Paris and you think that that's, or you're already in India. And that's an example of like, you're in the jhana in Paris and you think that that's enlightenment, but actually you have to get to India. India is enlightenment. Does that make sense? I said that quite in a confused way, but basically you can mistake where you are for where you've not yet got to, right? If you don't yet have the uh, full context of the path and that happens all the time. People have like an experience of bliss or something, they let go for a minute or they get maybe a really bright, intense nimitta and they think, oh, that must be enlightenment, you know, because they don't have the whole context. So, and this is very common. Very, very common. I think it's actually, what's the word for common? Uh, <laughs> what's the word when something's just spread ubiquitously? I mean, it's all pervasive throughout all the insight meditation scene, and it's just everywhere. Everyone thinks they're a stream winner and they, they haven't understood the truth of suffering in its entirety. Mm. So, this is why the Buddha's not cutting any corners here. Right, so we'll get on to the next paragraph. Just trying to make sure, okay. So this is an excerpt from Majjhima number nine. Understanding the unwholesome and the wholesome. So this is by the venerable Sariputta, the Buddha's right-hand disciple, chief disciple. When friends, a noble disciple understands the unwholesome and the root of unwholesome, the wholesome and the root of the, of the wholesome, in that way they are one of right view, whose view is straight and who has perfect, perfect confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And what friends is the unwholesome? What is the root of the unwholesome? What is the wholesome? And what is the root of the wholesome? The destruction of life is unwholesome. Taking what is not given is unwholesome. Sexual misconduct is unwholesome. False speech is unwholesome. Divisive speech is unwholesome. Harsh speech. Idle chatter is unwholesome. So they're the five kinds of wrong speech. I have a nice little... Um, what do you call them? Acronym, if anybody wants to memorize those five. For my higher good. That's only four. That must be four, yeah. For my higher good. So we abstain from false speech, for my malicious speech, higher, uh, harsh speech, good, gossip. Anyway, I find that quite helpful because <laughs> I have to remember these things. And of course, you want to make sure that you're not only abstaining from false speech, but also, yeah for my malicious or divisive speech, harsh, harsh speech. And then, yeah, the last one, gossip or idle chatter. Okay, so just the kind of speech that wastes people's time. And then further, covetousness is unwholesome, ill will is unwholesome, and wrong view is unwholesome. So you can see that this is changing now from the precepts yeah, the first three were like the 
those three precepts or three of the main precepts but now we've gone into covetousness is unwholesome and I would suggest that that probably it could be a translation of abidja which is wrongly translate well there's a word in the uh, Satipatthana Sutta abidja domanasam and they've translated it as covetousness but really it, it means wanting craving desire so it just means that first hindrance, you know, anything where you're just wanting, you're craving, yeah? you're attaching, you're desiring. And then ill will is unwholesome, second hindrance. Yeah? So ill will, aversion, anger, irritation, frustration, anything that falls on the side of um, negativity, not wanting. And then wrong view is unwholesome. So that's interesting. And I'm glad I read out the other wrong views because in there, the Buddha says why they're unwholesome. It's not that they're wrong, it's that they lead to suffering. I mean, they're wrong in the sense that they lead to suffering. It's not a moral judgment as much as compassionate judgment. Yeah. So the Buddha was saying for all of those that with those wrong views, um, it can be expected that people will avoid good bodily, verbal and mental conduct. So this is tying into this, right? If you don't have right view, you don't take care of your precepts. There's no need. And that you don't see the danger and degradation in the unwholesome. So you don't realize how you're defiling your mind. Yeah, You don't realize what blocks and obstacles you're putting to your own progress, to samadhi, to enlightenment. You think that your anger is going to get you somewhere. I mean, it's hard sometimes. You feel angry and it makes you act in positive ways to protect. But the thing is, if that's coming from anger rather than compassion, it will just tire you out in the end. And unfortunately, if you're not in such a good mood or <laughs> it can be misdirected in different circumstances. So, of course, we all have a degree of anger until we're on the third stage of enlightenment. So it's not that our actions are always going to be 100 percent pure and free from anger and only meta and compassion but just to see that uh, we understand the danger and degradation in that. Mm -hmm. and, and also people with wrong view don't understand the blessing of renunciation. So we have to understand not only the danger of hanging on to these unwholesome states, but the blessing of putting them down. Yeah. Of course, in this case, I think he's talking about renunciation as in actually renouncing the householder's life, renouncing... Um, and becoming a monastic. But renunciation is also part of the path for all of us to different degrees. And, and um, you know, the third noble truth is all about abandoning. The way out of suffering is about letting go, giving, giving away, giving up, um, letting go of anger. Yeah. So that's also the blessing of renunciation. Yeah. So, so we've now talked about all the types of unwholesome, yeah? Does anyone want to recap or are you with me still? You all good? So this is called the unwholesome. And then he goes on to what is the root of the unwholesome? Because the Buddha is always trying to get at the cause, the root, so that we can actually address it at the deepest level. Greed is a root of the unwholesome, loba. Hatred is a root of the unwholesome, dosa. And delusion is a root of the unwholesome, moha. This is called the root of the unwholesome. So whenever we do something, you know, that harms another by body, speech or mind, we need to check, is it motivated by greed, hatred, Hatred is a strong word. It just means anything on the side of not wanting, not, in, not liking, you know, a negative reaction to some sort of sense input and delusion, just ignorance, not being aware of what's really going on. So we do things that perhaps we didn't mean to do. Um, it doesn't mean that when we harm a person, there's always greed, hatred and delusion there. Sometimes it's just a matter of not using very skillful words or sometimes, I mean, our ego just gets offended. I mean, even Arjun Brahm can say things to me with pure compassion and metta and I'll, I'll get upset, you know, sometimes. 
because I take it wrong or <laughs> it just it just touches a little bit of the sense of self that's you know that's triggered um so we can be hurt I mean even the Buddha had enemies right but um I think it's really helpful to to look at our behavior and to sort of identify any time that we have perhaps acted or spoken in an unwholesome way you know how does that and can you see what root is there can you see the root if you maybe just think of a few examples now might be a good time to share. Is there a time that any of you have done something that you later regretted? And can you identify whether that was motivated by greed, hatred or delusion? And how, how did it feel? Like, how do you know? How do you know? How does that arising of greed, hatred and delusion, how does it manifest? I just want to see. Okay. So one person has their hand up. Do you want to unmute and say their name, Kelly? I'll, I'll give over to you to yes, unmute people. In. I have unmuted Janaki. Great. Okay. Can I, can I ask, <coughs> say something? Um, yeah, sure. Do you want to comment on what I asked or something else? Uh, yeah, just uh, probably more or less like a comment, really, because okay. I too found it uh, very difficult to understand the uh, meaning of, uh, you know, a right will, uh, because uh, it's it, the right word, it's most of the time very confusing because it's a comparative term because uh, people will yeah. always want to know what is right what is wrong because different people accept it at different levels so but if uh, i mean later in your expl explanation in the second part of course yes the you know the real meaning came out you know it is actually uh, what i think i mean what i accept it as uh, it as uh, good or harmonious yeah, or wholesome even, uh, wholesome mm -hmm. acts or wholesome, yeah, uh, perspectives. Yeah, then it is more meaningful because um, it's it has got to do something with the harmony of, uh, with the env environment and the people and all living beings within it, inside mm -hmm. that. So I, <laughs> I took it as either good or harmonious. Or okay, can I jump in already? Can I jump in and add to that? Because I think that's true to a degree, but actually it's right in the sense that it's leading to the culmination, to the consummation of the holy life. So it's bigger than that. It's bigger than just harmony. It's, there's more to it than that because we can have right view that's not the Buddha's right view that still leads to harmony, that still leads to keeping precepts and being a good person. But if it doesn't include an understanding of karma, if it doesn't include an understanding of the Four Noble Truths, then it won't lead to liberation. So it's actually right. The Buddha really means that it's right in the sense that it leads to liberation. And that's the important thing there with right. So a different view is right if you want to go in a different direction. Like if I want to be, I don't know, go to heaven, then maybe my Christian faith is right in the sense that it's got my beliefs. If I adopt the Christian beliefs, they'll be the right beliefs to turn me to heaven, maybe. Right. I mean, I don't believe that, but someone would believe that and they might be right about that. Does that make sense? It's right in the sense that it's leading in in the direction the Buddha is trying to bring us. Yes, I mean, Buddhist, I mean, if someone who does not have a very deep understanding in Buddhism, then of course, it will, the person will find it really, very really difficult to find out what does this word right yeah. really mean. That's, that's why we practice. Yeah, yeah. that's why we so, practice. It refines itself along the way. But anyway, could I ask if there's a specific question? Because I do want to open this up to other people to... to sure, um, okay, thank you. Yeah, nothing? No, nothing, thank you. Okay. So would anybody else like to comment on anything that's happened, any, any time that you've noticed in your actions of body or speech or mind? Um, 
where there's been a very obvious motivation of greed, hatred or delusion. And how does that, how do you know? How does it feel? How does it arise? James? I can't hear you, James. I don't know if your sound is on. Do you want to fiddle about and then I'll go to Audra first and then come back in a bit? It might be that you have to do something with your settings. So I'll go to Audra first, good luck. Otherwise you can write it in the box if you want. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, I think um, like sometimes I'll, I'll feel one emotion like anger and it feels so true. Mm. Um, but then if I investigate, there's, there's almost always something underneath it, um, like fear or, you know, like, um, mm. or jealousy or, you know, you know, greed, lobe, something like that. It's never the bottom. I think the first thing that I feel, you know, it's, um, and so it's just, um, you know, being able to, uh, you know, become present mm -hmm. and slow the mind down and, uh, you know, become like a centered, grounded, whatever word you want to use and to, um, and to investigate. And then, uh, and then I find that it's like, oh, that's, it's not true. You know, what I, what I initially thought and mm -hmm. I can, um, I can come to uh, a place of peace um, after I investigate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Very, very insightful points. Very insightful because um, it's always the case that with greed, hatred or delusion, we're not seeing things as they are. We can't because our mind is basically bent by the hindrances, you know, greed and hatred are the first two hindrances. And the Buddha said, the definition of those hindrances is obscurations of the mind that distort, that um, obscure wisdom or weaken wisdom and bend the truth. And they also nourish delusion. So whenever we're angry or, you know, craving about, for anything, we're increasing delusion. So it's really interesting what you say, because I also think that in a sense, anger is almost like the most superficial of those three. And underneath there are deeper roots. I mean, the deepest, I think for all of them is this delusion. You know? Delusion is the reason we're reborn. Delusion is the first in the link of the Paticca Samapada, the arising of suffering. It's all from delusion. So, yeah, the main delusion being that there's a sense, you know, that there's a me here who's being offended or upset or, you know, who wants things to be different than they are. <laughs> yeah, who, who wants things to be permanent and stable when actually things are impermanent and completely changeable. Mm. Who wants things to be happy and peaceful and that's not the way life is. So it's like... The delusion is that we haven't really understood that and made peace with those three characteristics. Yeah, yeah, so true that often underneath the anger, there's, um, I think, fear. And also I notice for myself, it's usually hurt, some kind of sadness, actually. In fact, I very rarely feel anger. I'm usually straight at sadness or, or I internalize it. It becomes like more like depression. Yeah but it's still in that field of the negativity. Yeah, Emma, can we come to you? Can't hear you either, I wonder why. Can anyone else hear Emma, is it just me? Yeah, that's it. I think you just said it quite wonderfully, actually. I mean, what, from my own practice, um, from what you just said, when anger, well, when any of them arise, really, um, there's that underlying emotion. Like for me, I, I always find it's more like a hurt or a sadness. Mm. Um, it's just basically just, um, and also even deeper than that is that is that strong sense of self, 
I, I've been exploring that a lot more in my own practice as well is well who is hurt um where is this person who do you know it's it's yeah. that's my own practice yeah, um there's that instant anger what's underlying anger usually it's sadness or hurt who's hurt it's it's a bit of a I don't know what the word is mind mind blowing <laughs> yeah great great that's just a comment just to say that you've you, you both said it quite quite wonderfully actually <laughs> no no I think it's much more interesting when people speak from their own experience and talk about their own practice so I really appreciate that um I think that's a very wise way to investigate and uh just one thing that might help a little bit as well in that is um even looking at this, who is this that's reacting in terms of the five candors? Do you know the five candors? So like, is it my body or is it my feeling that's reacting? Like, am I reacting to feelings? Is it the perception? Like, what is this thing anyway, you know, <laughs> that, that's upset or, or whatever? Yeah, often it's just like a perception that's making us upset, but the perception changes and then who's upset? The perception's changed, so you're not upset anymore. So, mm. <laughs> so you can even break it down a bit more into things like is it perception that's you know it's me what am I identifying with right now yeah. often it's our views as well we identify a lot with uh, our knowing <laughs> with the mind right I think this and somebody else doesn't and that's that that really gets close to the bone you know <laughs> That's really, it's like the essence of who I am is what I think, what I believe. <laughs> mm. I'm just going to look in the chat box because I see a couple of comments there which may be useful. Oh, not useful. I mean, I want to read them. Yeah, mostly motivated by fear, somebody said. So, yeah, that's on the side, like we said, of ill will. It's sort of more on the side of ill will, fear. It can some, yeah, it's usually on the side of ill will. With actions based on greed and hatred, I can feel driven by something in the moment, but then later on, I cannot have this feeling of peace, of true satisfaction that I have with actions based on compassion. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the thing is with greed and hate, they give us quite a bit of energy um, because they're based on a sense of self. So they give us a real sort of sense of existing and being solid. Uh, almost like a power they give us like a power we become very kind of but as I said it sort of burns itself out I think and that's why it leaves you more empty than peaceful as in empty in a sort of drained way mm -hmm. very very interesting observation you don't have a feeling of peace or true satisfaction that you have with actions based on compassion yeah and this is you know Sometimes it's hard, as I said, to have something entirely based on compassion. But I guess it's looking toward how we can improve the ratio <laughs> of anger to compassion, right? I mean, even especially with stuff like activism, I think just having enough time to process the difficult feelings. And it's really hard. I mean, for example, the people in Burma now, they're not having the time. They're not having any safe space day or night to sit down, process the trauma, I mean, how can you process that anyway in one day or one night? This is like going to be with the people for generations and they don't have that, you know, that opportunity. And after a while, that's going to build up. That's my fear. It builds up into trauma to the extent that then people start thinking in unfortunate ways and resorting to violence. You know, that's my fear in that kind of situation. But yeah, for other types of activism, where most of the time we're not on the front lines, I think it's really important to be able to process the feelings and accept the anger. Don't condemn the anger, actually let it rise, but let it rise in a context where you're not going to harm anyone. You know, you can just give it the compassion and the care that it needs and come to a more balanced view. And then your actions are not only more compassionate, they're also wiser. They're much wiser because you're clearer about what's needed in that moment. It's like these hindrances are always called um, 
obscurations, things that obscure wisdom. So it's like we're not seeing things clearly. We're seeing part of it, but it's not clear. Yeah, Scott also said, uh, yeah, as well as like investigating who is angry, the illusion that someone else is the target of that anger, <laughs> that there's a being that's the target um, or that somebody else is, yeah, to blame for that anger that can also, this is of course, one of the problems with rape, um, race uh, crimes, racist crimes, like the what we saw in America happening, you know, that somebody's directing their hate towards somebody, making them a scapegoat for something which is absolutely nothing to do with that person. It's their hate that's the problem. It's their extreme veering off the path. So as long as we have the perception of self, we get affected by the eight vicissitudes of life. That's how I try to look at things, yes. Praise, blame, fame, disrepute, pleasure, pain, and what's the other one? I always forget the, all of them. Uh, anyway, another one of those dichotomies. I think we may have an unacknowledged sense of entitlement, and if we suddenly lose something, we get very upset, yeah. This can manifest in anger, irritability, or depression. I suppose the root defilement here is attachment. Yeah, which is greed again, you know, grasping. I prefer the word grasping to attachment because that's more like what it means. It's more like upadana means like upa is like up and dana is like adana is the opposite of giving. It means taking. So it's upadana actually means like taking something up. Like you take it up, you hold on to it too tightly. I prefer that because that also implies that the opposite is to put it down or to let it go rather than to detach which can be misinterpreted sometimes as a form of bypass. Um, yeah, grasping. So all that goes back to the greed defilement. Gain and loss, yes. Thank you. Excellent. Nice, lively discussion. We still have time as well. All right, so... Okay, now we're on to the wholesome. So this is the bit we can get really happy about and start putting into practice, right? Sometimes easier to just start doing more good than to stop all the things that we're accustomed to doing in a negative way. Just start doing loads of good. And what is the wholesome? Abstention from the destruction of life is wholesome. Abstention. Yeah, I'm gonna say abstaining, it just sounds better. Abstaining from taking what is not given is wholesome. Abstaining from sexual misconduct is wholesome. Abstaining from false speech is wholesome. Abstaining from divisive speech is wholesome. Abstaining from harsh speech is wholesome. Abstaining from idle chatter or gossip is wholesome. Non-covetousness, in other words, not being greedy or wanting what you haven't got is wholesome. Benevolence is wholesome. Benevolence. That's the opposite here of ill will. Benevolence. Beautiful. It's another word for metta then. Benevolence. I love that word. And right view is wholesome. This is called the wholesome. And what is the root of the wholesome? You can probably guess because now here the Buddha's talking in negative terms. Non-greed is a root of the wholesome. Non-hatred is a root of the wholesome. And non-delusion is a root of the wholesome. This is called the root of the wholesome. So I'd like to make a couple of comments about this because here we're talking in negatives of the previous one, which is great in the sense that, you know, it implies that if you simply don't have the negative ones, the positive ones will already be there. But there's also a possibility to develop the opposites, right? So, for example, by abstaining from the destruction of life, that's wonderful. You're not killing, you're not harming. But you can go further than that. And this is in the Majjhima number 51, gradual training. You can actually protect life. 
And there's this, in this sutta, it says, um, with rod and weapon laid aside, merciful and compassionate, with compassionate concern, something like that, for all life, one protects life. This is also what's motivating the protests in Burma, this wish to protect life. And it's incredible that the protesters are even protecting to the degree they can. And I mean, it has all blown up worse, um, but there are times that they're actually protecting the military as well by offering water, by saying, hey, let's cool down here. Let's try not to do things we'll regret later on. <laughs> I mean, this is really incredible, right? Really incredible. And then you've got all the doctors and nurses. I think 90% of civil servants have left their jobs because I mean, what, what can they do? Everything's getting blown up. Uh, so they've left and they're on the front, they're part of the civil disobedience movement and they're, they're on the streets and they're just performing their duties there. The nurses are performing and the doctors are performing whatever they can on the streets in the middle of this civil disobedience. They're creating, trying to create quiet, safe corners behind barricades, you know, where they can administer some medical care. So this is what you call really taking that precept to the extreme positive level and that is just inspirational you know really inspirational then abstaining from taking what's not given is wholesome but the opposite is generosity right and bhikkhu bodhi says that generosity is like the whole thrust of the path it's the whole movement of the path it's not a path to acquire or to gain it's a, a path of letting go giving giving away uh, giving is so uh, close to letting go, close to abandoning, close to that third noble truth again. So instead of taking, we start to see what can I do to help? What can I do? What can I give? Maybe physical help, aid, sign a petition, just using this example because it's very much close to my heart and in all of our minds right now. Um, sometimes giving moral support. Someone on the front line was saying, you know, if there's anything you can do, it's just to tell us that you care, you know, for us to know that the world is with us and that you're supporting us. You know, this is one of the most important things that you can do is to give that moral support, that encouragement, giving, giving. Abstaining from sexual misconduct is wholesome because, of course, by doing that, you're giving someone the gift of trust. You become a trustworthy person. You know that your partner, your spouse, is not going to cheat on you. If they do, perhaps they'll be honest enough to tell you about it. Or if they're really um, you know, committed to this, you can talk even before these things happen. You know, I know a couple actually in Perth, this happened and, uh, one, and she was actually, there was a monk who's now an ex-monk. He was trying to kind of hit on this woman <laughs> who lived at um, the meditation center there, um, which monks really shouldn't. And she was married, right? But she told her husband, she said, oh, I'm having feelings for this person. And um, she was very honest. He said, oh, you know, silly thing kind of. He just like listened and took it quite lightly. And anyway, they're fine. They're still together. That monk long ago disrobed. <laughs> he actually went off with someone else. Not sure I should say things like this, but you know, monks are human beings, right? And they're not necessarily free from these uh, <laughs> these things. So, but I think that was quite a nice example of a, of a relationship where they could be honest before it led into any kind of um, betrayal, which would have had terrible um, a terrible outcome. So then, abstain from false, divisive, or malicious harsh, idle speech or gossip is wholesome. And again, in the Majjhima Nubkaya number 51, big flag for it, go and read it if you can. It's called the Kanda Raka Sutta. I don't know if anyone can write it in the chat box. Majjhima Nikaya 51. Um, it's very beautiful. It goes into real detail about the opposite of this. So it talks about speech, which is true, which one can trust. Um, which brings people together rather than divides, that divides, sorry, that unites the divided, um, that creates harmony. Uh, speech, which instead of being harsh is, is gentle and pleasant, instead of wasting people's time is worth recording. Speech, which um, goes to the heart, it says in this sort of 
So it's very beautiful because we all have this, we have to speak in our day, even if it's only on Zoom. <laughs> so can we choose words that are uplifting? Not just, okay, I come to this class and I just, you know, if I came to this class and I just said, right, I'm not, I'm abstaining from divisive, harsh and idle speech. So I just sit here and don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm not really, uh, yeah, I'm not really practicing virtue in the in the right con in the right way for the context. <laughs> right? You'd rather that I say something that's maybe encouraging or inspiring, or at least read what the Buddha said. Yeah. Actually, that's the best. <laughs> mm. And then, right? Oh, okay. So then, non covetousness is wholesome. So that's non-greed. Being content, I think, is the opposite there, isn't it? Being content with what you have, being grateful for what you have, truly grateful, not only like this is good enough, but like this is wonderful. There's a cute talk by Ajahn Brahm and he's talking about how he got so happy one evening because somebody had bothered to chop up one chocolate bar. Now they have about 40 chocolate bars every day at least for the monks I mean I it's in a big big plastic box you know it's just a massive box full of chocolate but in that day, in those days there was one chocolate bar so someone cut it all up into small small pieces and uh, they gave Ajahn Brahm one piece all wrapped up nicely on his little saucer in the evening and he said I was just so touched so grateful that this was one piece of chocolate that somebody had bothered you know somebody worked hard to buy the chocolate bar and to bring it to the monks, thinking the monks would enjoy this. And then the Anagarika, you know, the lay attendant had taken all this care to put it on the plate and to chop it so that everyone got a piece. And he, he said it was just so wonderful. And it's wonderful, isn't it, when we can be so delighted with little. The, the potential for happiness is just infinite <laughs> because we don't need much. So, when you need a lot, you're never going to be satisfied. You know, there's this like a massive bucket that you can never fill. And the holes, in a sense, in that bucket are the non-gratitude, right? The discontent. So we plug it up with contentment and gratitude, then it fills really easy. And then the last one, benevolence is wholesome. So that's very obvious because that's a positive word, benevolence. Isn't that a gorgeous word? I wonder what he's translated there. Do you know, Derek? Derek studied the Chinese. Do you know which word he's translated there for benevolence? Maybe it's loving kindness. I don't know. You know, you don't know? Yeah, but benevolence to me is very, I think it is a nice translation for metta. This attitude of benevolence, wishing people well, because for metta, you don't have to feel loving necessarily. You just have to have this heart full of good wishes, like you wish a person well um, you want for their protection you want for their well-being benevolent of course metta should also be goodwill and good feelings towards a person and right view is wholesome so there you go even by reading these suttas we're developing the wholesome because we're learning more and more about right view and what is the root? So non-greed, non-hate, and non-delusion is the root. So the opposite of that, of course, non-greed. What's the opposite of that? My mind's gone a bit tired now. Non-greed is a root of the wholesome. What's the opposite of non-greed? In a positive way. Like mm, giving up, giving away. Being generous, generosity, I don't know. Write anything in the box if you wish. Non-hatred is the root of the wholesome. I think the opposite of that, oh, I know what the opposite of non-greed is, isn't it? Um, it's, I mean, one way of interpreting it is that, is a kind of um, moving towards the pleasure of the mind, like not being greedy for sensuality but renouncing, so, ah, that's right. The opposite of non-greed is renunciation. <laughs> the opposite is renunciation. So it's actually abandoning sense desire, mm -hmm. giving things up. And then the opposite of non-hate, of course, non-hate is actually a synonym again for metta, of yapada. It's um, 
one of the three right intentions. And then non-delusion. So the opposite of that is vidya. Delusion is avidya. And the opposite of that is vidya, which is wisdom. The opposite of delusion is wisdom. So developing wisdom into things like the Four Noble Truths. This is the root of the wholesome. So, wow, already 20 past eight. So perhaps we can just have any more comments or input around that. And let's see if we can have someone, if there is anyone who hasn't spoken, I'll give you priority first, but those who have a welcome again, keep your hand up. Uh, but I'd like to give others a chance. I'm also going to the chat box. You won't be recorded if you're speaking. I mean, your video won't be recorded, but your voice will. So I'm just looking down into the chat box. So I'll just read out from Diana. Finding balance between recognizing that the unwholesome exists and we must accept things as they are. So accept that these unwholesome harmful things exist without condoning them and maybe even taking a stand against them, definitely. But without our own behavior becoming unwholesome, yeah. Finding a way to hold it all, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think that's why people with a deep acceptance of the Four Noble Truths are able to act and engage more skillfully because they really have such an acceptance that they're not going to move into such, uh, they're not going to move towards negativity. And it's, I notice for myself, it's like if I don't accept suffering, then I really struggle when I'm suffering, you know, or like then I'm more likely to feel annoyed with someone else for causing me a bad day or something because I'm actually still wrestling with suffering instead of just accepting, oh yeah, this is, this is life, right? I'm suffering because, because of wrong view, because I'm uh, taking it personally, or, you know, or I'm wanting it to be different. I'm actually trying to push the suffering away and thus causing more suffering. So yeah, I think there's a definite sort of, there's a like a spectrum between accepting things as they are and just accepting them and then taking a stand, yeah, not condoning is the middle of that, and then taking a stand is the more active side. And I think we're always some, we wanna be somewhere on that spectrum all the time. And I personally feel that the stronger we get in the practice, the more we can move towards speaking out against things. So not only we don't condone them, we say we don't condone them, right? We make that visible, we make that clear, we become allies. We speak up for minorities, we speak out against racism and take a stand. That means we start to actually do some sort of anti-racist work using that as an example. And then we go out and demonstrate if need be. But yes, we have to be very careful that we don't allow our behavior to become unwholesome. And also forgive yourself if it does, it's not like, unless you're sure that your behavior won't ever be unwholesome, you better not do anything because that's just fear, isn't it? That's just like the idea of sin or something like, oh, if you do anything wrong, you'll be punished. I think it's really about your motivation. That's the most important thing. Try and get that as pure as you can, be as confident in that as you can. And, you know, you'll say things that aren't skillful sometimes. I mean, you'll make mistakes, you'll, you know, maybe even endanger yourself or others, but you can learn from that. So I think we have to really respect where we are in that spectrum from time to time and be somewhere in it. Don't always be at one end and or always at the other end, but maybe shift sometimes more accepting, more, you know, introspective. Other times we, we do more, we speak out. I mean, in my life, a lot of the time I'm engaged and I mean, I'm putting a lot of petitions up on my social media platform at the moment, but then there's times when I'm offline completely for a month or for the whole range retreat. So that's the way I balance it. Uh, 
I know that some of you, in fact, Diana, I know, has been taking, I think, a day or even a couple of days every week or month, I forget, to meditate. Just a retreat day, and that's really, really skillful. Really, really skillful. It's like pressing pause, allowing it all to settle. Hmm. Wow, 20 new messages. Oh my goodness. Let's have a look. Benevolence is kindness to all, indeed. It is metta. I wonder what the Pali word is. I have to try and figure that out. Generosity, contentment, generosity, renunciation. Yes, surely you're right. It was renunciation. But it's the same thing, really. Generosity. Giving, you know the third noble truth. Do people know what the third noble truth is? It's giving away, letting go of that very same craving, which is the cause of suffering. And the four words that the Buddha uses, chaga, patinisago, mutti, analio, and they're all different types of letting go. Chaga means generosity. It means like giving, or you can say giving away, also giving away like the no good things, but also giving the good things. So like when you meditate, you give all your metta to the moment, you know, you give all your care and attention to whatever arises. So that's one way. And then Chaga Patinisago is more like abandoning, like throwing things out, throwing things out like that you don't need. So it's like, what is holding me down? What is burdening me? What is, you know, kind of keeping me stuck? and you let it go. Like when you're meditating, I notice sometimes there's just a little bit too much, uh, um, how to say, it's like the hand is a little bit tight, not very tight, but the mind is just a little bit more tense than it has to be. And then I can uh, just just back off a little bit and that's a kind of, uh, I can abandon that bit of tension, you know? So abandoning, Chaga Patanisca Mutti is like freeing, freeing yourself from anything negative, unnecessary, past, future, regrets, remorse, <laughs> freeing, freeing the mind. Uh, Muti Analio is like um, not letting things fester or get stuck or build into resentment. or mm, And at a deeper level, it means kind of like not having anywhere for them to actually land. So not even having a sense of self where things can affect you. You know, realizing people are the way they are. I mean, they're not even people. Everything that arises is conditions. It's the effect of people's conditioning, right? So they are the way they are. They're doing their best mostly. And sometimes their best is terrible. I mean, if the you know military are doing their best, then, mm, but it can be that that's their best because they've been brainwashed in a, themselves in a dictatorship from most of their lives. And they've, out of poverty being conscripted, you know, um, and then brainwashed and instilled with fear. They've never had international exposure, et cetera, et cetera. They've been, you know, bred a diet of fear, poverty, bribes, threats from those above. Hmm? So perhaps we should rejoice whenever they don't kill protesters. So it seems I've come to the end of the session and I can see that Gunther is actually wanting to give a little talk because he had put some dana links in the box but he was brave enough to say that he'd do a little dana talk so do you want to do that for a couple of minutes just mention a couple of minutes uh, i would like to talk about dana <laughs> and uh, buddhist monastics like venerable chanda they practice generosity through sharing the dhamma and this offers those who value this, like hopefully us, an opportunity to practice generosity to providing for the material needs. If you're able to contribute, your donation would be deeply appreciated. Um, they will enable Venerable Chanda not only to continue spreading the Dhamma, but will also greatly support the development of the first Bikuni Monastery in the United Kingdom, which is a wider aim of the Anukampa project. You can find more details about the project and how to donate on the Anukampa website and on the link in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gunther, and thank you to all the co-hosts, the ones who were running this session in particular. So 
Kelly and Matthias recording it for you all to revisit and Gunther, you're doing a great job and to Derek and to Mel who trained them up and yeah, Derek opened the meeting. I think Mel's here tonight as well, but I can't see her on my screen. Um, so yeah, really, really grateful to have the opportunity to share with you all and that we are able to develop this beautiful sense of community. It's, uh, it's really incredibly encouraging, incredibly nourishing for me as well, you know, because I love talking about the Dhamma, but I have no one here with me. I haven't had anyone for 12 months. I've had two visits, two in 12 months, <laughs> very short visits. Um, so it's really an indulgence to get to share the Dhamma. So I hope that something has been of benefit and you can continue to explore and apply it to your daily life and practice. I hope that, uh, that little by little, all beings become free from suffering. And I wonder if um, if I could indulge us all by sharing some merits or, or some metta to end. Shall we do that? And holding in mind, for me, I have to say the Burmese people are at the forefront of my mind because I, I know that country. I know the depth of purity, integrity, practice, goodness that the people have and how they've preserved the Dhamma for so long. But there were people everywhere throughout history and even throughout the world right now, also suffering under such oppressive military regimes and suffering for all kinds of different reasons, whether it's the COVID or whether it's poverty, whether it's an excess of wealth, right? The isolation and loneliness that can bring, maybe the corruption by power and all the ordinary kinds of suffering we all experience just sometimes in just not really having a clear sense of what all this is about, you know, why we're really here and how to make our lives meaningful. So for all of us who sincerely are doing their best, you know, and uh, for all those who are struggling right now in whatever way as oppressor or oppressed, may we all be happy and well, may we all be peaceful, may we all be liberated. And I'll chant the, uh, a little Burmese meta chanting Sabe Sata Sabe Pana Sabe Buddha Sabe Pugala Sabe Atabawa Pariapana Sabaitio Sabe Purisa Sabe Aria Sabe Anaria Sabe Dewa Sabe Manusa Sabe wini padika Awe ra hon tu Abya paja hon tu Ani ga hon tu Sukiatanam pariyanam tu Dukha munjan tu Yada lada sampatito Mawe gachantu Kamasaka For those who know, we can do the three big sadhus. For those who don't know, you might learn the three big sadhus Perth style. Sad. Sadhu, Sadhu. <laughs> Yay, very good. <laughs> it's nice to end with a smile. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Ramesh Bellu. Is it your first time? I don't know if I've seen you both before. Is it your first time? 
one of you. I don't know if we can ask you to unmute at this point. It's really nice to see two of you there. Yes, good to see you after a long yes. time. Yes, oh, thank you. Good, good, good. Lovely. From Leicester, we are. We're from Leicester. <laughs> from Leicester, that's right. I thought you looked Yes, here. I'm sure we've seen you here. We have, yes. It's yes. good to join you. Oh, wonderful. I'm glad you could come. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Great. So we'll unmute all of you now and we can wave goodbye. <laughs>